Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone, each and all, to White Raymond Podcast. My name is Terrence. This is the Christian based podcast where we focus primarily on Jesus Christ as well as overcoming and getting the victory over our sins. For the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And we are on episode 6. Episode 6. You know, in the last episode, I made a slight mistake. And I uh, had mentioned at the beginning of the video that it was episode four, but it was actually episode five, obviously. And that was on uh, makeup is witchcraft. But this episode, actually, it was, uh, I did title because I have a list uh, in my phone of notes of different topics that I, you know, considered talking about. And uh, in my notes... I had for this episode to talk about plant-based versus vegetarian, Um, but I believe uh, the Lord impressed me to talk about a very serious topic, one that I believe the world as a whole has heard about in some form or fashion, one way or, or another. Everyone has heard about the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast. And you know, um, just to kind of prepare everything before I get into it, uh, my voice may sound different than my prior videos. And uh, I had actually come, come down with a cold. Uh, my wife actually, when she was away uh, over my parents' house with my daughters, uh, they had actually I think it was somewhere else. Like it probably was at church or something like that. My wife had uh, come in contact, I believe, with one of our family members, and uh, it was one of the child children that was sick, and so she had got sick when she was away with my my father, and then once she had come back, um, you know. I ended up getting sick. And so now, if I sound different, that's why. It's because I am uh, just came down with the cold, too. I think it was yesterday. I think it started yesterday. Either yesterday or uh, the day before that, maybe like the night before yesterday. And so, and also, I don't know if you can see, but my eyes, is, I think it looks a little bit red in the camera. And my eyes are droopy, so... And right now my body is aching and stomach hurting, nose is uh, running, and I got a cough and so many things. But uh, I just say that just so, you know, maybe throughout this study I may have to cough or sneeze or something like that. But I pray that the this podcast episode and study will be beneficial to you uh, by God's grace. And so the topic again. The mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast, right? A lot of, there are a lot of influencers right now. I've been scrolling through TikTok, scrolling through Facebook, scrolling through Instagram, and everyone has what they believe to be the mark of the beast. Um, many people think that it's, uh, by popularity, they think that it's a, a computer chip or some kind of uh, microscopic uh, piece of hardware or tech that is to be planted or implanted in someone's uh, body. And then there are others that believe that it's something else. And uh, actually, I don't, the only ones that I usually hear about is the chip, computer chip. Uh, I think I've heard others, but I can't, it doesn't come to mind what those other uh, ideas of it was, but what is it exactly, right? Uh, And another thing to to kind of ponder upon is when people are mentioning what the mark of the beast is, they don't necessarily give proof. Like, no one gives the scripture proof or the evidence to back up their statements. They just say, 
the mark of the beast is a computer chip because Elon Musk or this person, uh, the president, they're building some neural link. Uh, it's always something that ha they see in the world and they tie into what the Bible says, but they don't explain what exactly is the mark of the beast from the Bible. If the Bible was the first uh, origin of you knowing about the mark of the beast, then the Bible should tell you exactly what it is, right? Just like uh, if someone is going to mention uh, Elon, uh, you shouldn't tell me what a cyber truck does, right? Unless if you haven't driven one and know the ins and outs of a cyber truck, then you don't know what a cyber truck is. You can say it's a truck and it, it does this and that, but the or the origin of it, the creator of it, the person who came up with the concept is the one that would know the ins and outs of it. So we would go to ask him instead of you, right? That's that's how it should be, essentially. Uh, go to the horse's mouth, so to speak, to get the information. But many people on various platforms have their own concept of what they think the mark of the beast is. And the terrible thing about it is one can tell you what they perceive the mark of the beast to be. And if it's wrong, then your life may be in danger. Right. Because if you're following someone who says the mark of the beast is this and then the Bible doesn't back that idea up or the Bible doesn't uh, substantiate that claim, then eternal life is at stake. So if you choose to believe something that someone else says is truth without them giving you any scriptural proof for it, then your life, your eternity may be in danger. So do you want to risk it is the question. Do you want to risk it? It's better to understand what God says from God. Let's not go to other people and see what they think about it, right? And one may say, well, what about you? You're going to do a study about it right now, so we don't have to listen to you. Well, the difference is I'm going to go through the Bible and show you. That's the difference. That's the only difference. I'm going to show you what God says. And that's what we that's what we should want to know. What what does God say about the mark of the beast, right? What does God say? Cuz he's the one that brought up the term. He's the one that made the phrase mark of the beast in Revelation. So what does he have to say about it? That's what that is what our mind should uh, present as a question to ourselves. Uh so what is the mark you know, I did all of that rambling just to come back to what is the mark, actually? Uh, and we're going to go through the Bible. By no means will this be an extensive or exhaustive study because uh, there are so many other things to uh, reflect upon and double back and read and confirm here and confirm there. The Bible mentions going precept upon precept and line upon line here a little, there a little, basically comparing scripture with scripture in other places to see if what you're mentioning is the truth. Uh, it'll be mentioned somewhere else in the same uh, same form or fashion. I'll just use that word or that phrase. So what is the mark of the beast and where is it mentioned, right? We can go to Revelation. Revelation, we will go to uh, Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Now, this is where the mark of the beast, <coughs> this is where the mark of the beast is mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. We will read beginning in verse 15. The Bible says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark 
in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Uh, the world renowned six 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 that everybody uh, is afraid of. That scary number, right? The Bible says that six hundred three score and six is the number of a man, right? And to a simple simple degree, the man was created on the sixth day, right? So six is the number of a man. Now, when you have six tripled, um, the Bible likes to triple it or to, to, it triples it to establish it or to stab, establish something in the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing is established. So the number of a man, if it's tripled, then it's the man being tripled, right? So, and the Bible also has a number for God, right? Seven. The seventh day is mentioned as the Lord's day in the beginning of time. After man was created on the sixth day, the Lord blessed the seventh day. Uh, and we sometimes we see uh, triple sevens, right? We see triple sixes. We see triple sevens. Seven is a complete number uh, in God's eyes. And six is a number of a man. Uh, and so... Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15 is where we first see the mark of the beast said or the mark of the beast put out into the world. Uh, there were a few things in Revelation chapter 13 that are worthy to reflect upon. And I think those things uh, will help us to be able to uh, understand as we go forward more about what the mark is and what the beast uh, is and what he does and what does the mark do and, you know, those things. So back to Revelation chapter 13. Let's read it again. Verse 16. There were some, some things there, right? Or actually, verse 15 again. What was uh, something that stood out that I think should be focused upon is that uh, the beast should both speak and cause right? What does cause mean? What does that word cause? Cause is basically force. The beast would speak and force, right? So we're going to have to find out first and foremost, what is the mark? And then what is the beast? Because we want to know what the mark of the beast is. So in order to find that, you need to know what is a beast? What is the mark? Then once you know those two, then you'll know what the mark of the beast is. Very simple. But in verse 15, it says, The beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So now the Bible adds in worship into this. So whatever the mark of the beast is, the beast wants people to worship something. I hope you see that. The beast would speak and cause that whoever would not worship, right? The image of the beast should be killed. There's a cause, there's an effect. The beast would force, first it said he would speak, but then it said he would force whoever would not worship to be killed, all right? The next verse, in verse 16, it says, And he, who is that? He who? The beast. One thing to notice, once you, when you read the Bible, uh, you'll catch on to things like this. Because it says, and he. It doesn't say, and it. Right? And he will force. Not, and it will force. So, if it doesn't say it, then it's not a thing. It's not... Uh, we can't tie it to a specific device or something to that degree because it says, and he will cause them or he will force them to worship, right? If it was, and it will force them, 
then we can say, oh, man, that might be a chip. That might be a computer chip or something that will cause us to worship the beast and have the mark in our hands. And uh, No, it says he. And it gives the gender, right? He. So it's going to be a male figure that will cause or force people to worship. And it goes on, it says, and he, in verse 16, and he causeth, again, he forces, is what cause, cause means, and he forces all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. What is the mark now? We'll go on to find out what the mark is, but uh, essentially, um, the mark is simply a sign, right? The mark is a sign. Some people will say it's going to be a visible mark. Some people say you're going to be able to see it from a mile away. Uh, but what does the Bible say about it? That's what we want to know. I don't want to know what you think the mark is. I want to know what the Bible thinks the mark is because God is speaking to me from the Bible. So I want to hear what he has to say so that I can be saved and my family as well, right? If you listen to someone else and they're wrong about what they think, then you're essentially being led astray, right, by a false prophet. Because a lot of people say, I have a spoken word from the Lord. The Lord, he just showed me in the vision that the mark of the beast is going to be a computer chip. And we all need to go and get all the water and buy up all of the. One can say that. But if the Bible says it's not a computer chip, then, then what's going on? What are you doing? Are you following the word, which was made flesh? Or are you following flesh, which is, us which is using the word? Right? It goes on, it says, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Right? And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the, no, or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Um, and so, <coughs> excuse me. And so this mark, uh, if one does not have this specific mark at the end of time, every earthly support will be cut off, is what the Bible is saying. You're, you won't be able to buy, you won't be able to sell. That's just about every earthly support, right? Your family can support you, but what happens if there are uh, situations where if someone finds out that they are helping you buy and sell, then they can be killed? Because again, the, the verse said, he causeth all to worship, and if they don't receive the mark, then they will be killed. So now what if your family gets involved and if they're helping you out because you choose not to worship, their life is on the line. So it's a serious thing. Very serious. Now, when was the first mark placed? Because the Bible has different stories where we can see the mark of the beast uh, in fruition. We can see uh, what the mark of the beast would uh, essentially be at the end of time, which is very close and uh, near future, I should say, near future. So we want to see a few examples of this concept of the mark of the beast, right? Buying and selling or uh, receiving a mark or every earthly support being cut off. Uh, we want to see it in, in practice because the Bible also says that those things which are past will be present or those things that was done in the past will happen again, right? It says there's no new thing under the sun, meaning whatever was done in the past will be done again. It's nothing new. So if we see a mark of the beast uh, near future, in our near future, if we see the mark of the beast then we can essentially say this isn't new. Even though to us, we will say, oh man, it just, it just came. This is the mark of the beast. What is going on? God will say, there's nothing new under the sun. This happened before. But did you know? Did you know that that happened already? Because if you did know, then you would already understand and you would comprehend what is going on. You will be prepared for it, 
that's God's purpose, to have us prepared for the mark of the beast crisis. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. I want to go to a example in the Bible where the mark of the beast uh, concept is shown or put into play, put into practice. Uh, this is the story of Cain and Abel. And this is where we actually see the first mark being placed on someone. Uh, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 4, make sure my hair is not going crazy. Uh, Genesis chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and he conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man, right? I have, and she said, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. This is also important to note. Sorry, uh, It says that Cain, it showed the profession of the two brothers. Um, Abel was a keeper of the sheep. He was a shepherd, which is Christ, uh, Christ's profession. And then it says his brother Abel was a, or his brother Cain, sorry, was a tiller of the ground. What is that? That's just basically someone who cultivates, right? A farmer, basically someone who's, uh, cultivating the ground, um, uh, producing, produce basically a tiller of the ground but it goes on to say in verse 3 and in process of time it came to pass there it says in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the and of the fat thereof and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So from verse 3 to verse 5, the Bible then paints the picture of the two brothers uh, coming before the Lord to present something, right? To present offerings. But in verse 3... It says, and in process of time, it came to pass. So after a certain time, something happened, right? And I want us to understand that this is a symbol of a judgment time, right? And in the process of time, it came to pass that the two brothers had brought offerings before the Lord. For what purpose? To see if the Lord accepted their offering, right? This is a judgment time. Let's read it again in verse 3. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and, his, and to his offering, he had not respect and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So what was it that the Lord respected about Abel's offering? Abel was a shepherd, remember? And he brought as an offering the firstlings of his flock. He probably brought a lamb or a sheep, something to that degree, right? To be an offering unto the Lord. But not only the lamb, he also brought the fat of the lamb. Now, that's very significant, and we're going to see that shortly after we uh, discuss a little bit more here. But he had brought the lamb, the firstlings of his flock, so the very best, and he brought the fat from the lamb to offer unto the Lord. Now, the Bible is a book that mentions a lot of offerings. You have different offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, uh, you know, so many offerings that the Bible mentions. And... It is said that animals need to be sacrificed when you bring these offerings, right? Someone needs to take your place or someone needs to die on your behalf because of your sin. This is the concept that we know all too well. 
the concept of Jesus, uh, a savior to come to be the death or the propitiation for our sins. Someone that will die in your place so you do not have to die, right? The concept was way back in Cain and Abel's day. Now it says in verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with his brother Abel, or with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Uh, am I my brother's keeper? That's where you get the, the popular phrase, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground, and now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth, right? And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, a criminal, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So what we see here is the first instance of a mark being placed on someone. What was the mark for? In this instance, the mark was placed upon Cain by the Lord because Cain was cursed in the earth. He was a cursed individual because of what he did, right? He mentioned that he would be a fugitive and a vagabond and that if anybody seen him, they would want to slay him. But God then places a mark upon Cain so that any finding him would not slay him. Or if they did, vengeance will be taken on them sevenfold, right? So you wouldn't want that to happen. I'm sure you would steer away from Cain. You might want to kill him, but you wouldn't because vengeance will be taken out on you sevenfold is what God said. But now, if Cain was to be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, a criminal, essentially, then who would help Cain, right? Would Cain be able to go to the city and buy whatever he needed from someone? No, because we hate you. We want to kill you. Would Cain be able to go and sell uh, some of his fruit to someone? No, we want to kill you. So as you can see here, Cain's buying and selling privileges were gone out the door because of the mark, right? Because he was cursed. Now, what about the mark, though? Because the mark said that it will be, or the Bible said that the mark would be uh, either in the right hand or the forehead, right? When Cain was wroth with his brother for being essentially uh, perfect before the Lord. Uh, he had done all that was required that God wanted. He said, Cain, if you do well, won't you be accepted as well? Why are you mad? Do well. If you don't do well, sin lieth at the door, is what God said. So, when Cain was wroth with his brother and in the field they were talking, Cain had come up with a very evil decision, right? His mind had decided, right? He had believed in his mind, uh, in his forehead, most likely, that I think I should kill my brother. I believe if my brother was gone, I could get away with it. Or 
my problems will be solved. That's what he believed. That's what his faith was in his mind. He believed that if I kill my brother, then I won't have to answer for it, right? He said, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is. Why are you asking me? So we now see the forehead coming into play because your forehead or your frontal lobe uh, is where your decision-making is being done, right? So the forehead, what about the hand? Well, after he decided in his mind to act upon his faith, right, in killing his brother, he then worked upon his thought. He then executed the thought with his hands. Do we see that? How did he slay his brother? Right? How did he slay him? He had to have taken his life with his hands. In fact, let's read it again. The Bible says in verse... Eleven, verse eleven of Genesis chapter four. It says, "And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand." So we see the forehead and the hand mentioned. Now Cain had a mark placed upon him by the Lord, right? And every earthly support was cut off. He was not able to buy nor sell. In fact, God even mentioned, uh, which verse was this? Let's see. Um, there's a verse that we just read. I forget which verse it was, where God says that the ground would not henceforth yield her strength unto him. Okay, verse 12. The next verse, actually. Uh, when thou tillest the ground, right, when you do your profession, which you have prior, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. So now, Cain was a tiller of the ground. That was his profession. That was his job. But he essentially lost his job because the curse was so great upon him. God said that the ground will not henceforth yield her strength to you like it did prior. Before, you can work the ground and get whatever you needed easy, right? It was easy to do your farmer job. But now, the earth will not help you anymore. So now you lost your job, and when you go to buy or sell something, everyone wants to kill you, so they don't want no dealings with you. Every earthly support cut off. That's exactly what we read in Revelation. Okay, let's go to another verse. Let's go to another verse. But we see that there was to be a time where two brothers, uh, two classes, right? One that served the Lord and was pleasing in his sight. The Lord had respect unto their offerings. And another who the Lord didn't have respect unto their offerings. Two classes. And there's only two masters, as the Bible mentioned. Let's go to another verse, though. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Just to uh, solidify the statement mentioned before about there being a judgment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9, the Bible says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad what is this saying saying that there is a time when God will judge the world right when everyone will be presenting their offering or the Lord will see what is being offered as they're living their lives so what will happen in the judgment? Well, the Lord will respect one offering once he see the life of the, life of the individual and what they had to offer, right? Uh, Abel brought the firstlings of his flock, the best of the best, and he brought the fat of the animal. Cain brought the fruit of the ground, right? 
The fruit of the ground was essentially what he had worked on, his own works, right? This is what I did. I grew this fruit, and I'm bringing it to you. You accept it. Cain brought the first of the flock, right? And shown God that he believed in a savior. He believed in someone to come. He believed in a propitiation. It is not because of me that I can be accepted, but because of the offering that I gave and the fat of the offering. So the Bible says that there will come a day when we will meet the judgment seat of Christ. Um, and this is definitely most likely going to be another study or another podcast episode. But when do you think the judgment is going to start? I want you to think about that. When does the judgment start? Right now, let's go to another verse. Acts 17, Acts 17, verse 29 through 31. We're just going to read this verse just to confirm the verse I just read to give you a, another witness, so to speak. The Bible says in Acts 17, verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at, right? At the times of our ignorance, when we didn't know any better, God winked at it. He said, okay, you didn't know about that. But, the Bible says, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. So the first view of the judgment with Cain and Abel, first view of the judgment was a view that had the mark in it, right? And we know a lot of people may know that in the book of Revelation, it talks about uh, Armageddon and the judgment of the world and the end of the world. Well, when we seen in Cain and Abel's case, the judgment that took place with them too had a mark tied to it. So we have to be very careful because... If we're considering the mark of the beast and we want to know what it is and when it is and who it is, or we want to know all these things, but we should definitely reconsider when does the judgment start for this mark, right? Because in the judgment, there will be many accepted and many rejected. The one that was rejected received the mark. The one that was accepted was killed or tried, someone killed that person, right? So I want us to keep that in mind because it's very serious. It's something that uh, I don't think the world uh, talks a lot about, right? And Satan is using all that he can to blind the eyes of each and every one of us. If we can go throughout our lives without understanding that we have to be uh, right before God and that we do have to meet the judgment seat of Christ at some time in our lives, then if you don't know those things, then you'll fail the judgment and you'll be rejected. And Revelation chapter three, you will receive a mark. But we'll see that as we go on. Now, let's go to another verse. Genesis uh, chapter Actually, let's go to Leviticus chapter 4, just to see um, what the Bible mentions about uh, the offering. We've seen that Abel had brought the firstlings of his flock, or the firstling of his flock, uh, and he brought the fat thereof. Now, what does that represent? Because we know that the lamb, or the offering that he brought to God, is the sacrifice, right? You kill the animal, uh, you drain the blood. Uh, you lay your sin, you lay your hands upon the animal and place your sins upon them. And that's, that's another story. But Abel had brought this sacrifice to God with fat. What is the fat? Leviticus chapter four, 
the Bible says in verse 32, and if he bring a lamb for a sin offering, he shall bring it a female without blemish and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay it for a sin offering in the place where they kill the burnt offering. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. Verse 35 says, and he shall take away all the fat thereof. This is still pertaining to the sacrifice, the offering as the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of the peace offerings and the priest shall burn them upon the altar according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for his sin that he hath committed and it shall be forgiven him. So what is the fat symbolizing the sin? Not only did he bring the sacrifice, but he brought his sin, right? I need a savior, which was the sacrifice. And I'm bringing my sin to you, God. Only you can save me by taking the sacrifice, Jesus, and by taking away my sin as well. The Bible mentioned both of those things being burnt on the altar or being destroyed, right? Christ was destroyed for us on the cross. But he did it so that the fat thereof can be destroyed as well. The fat that we bring to God, the sin. We got to take to God our sins and have it removed. That's the only way we're going to be able to be accepted, right? In his eyes, when we come before this judgment seat of Christ. Let's go to another verse. Let's go to uh, Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 15, the Bible says, The rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. The labor of the righteous tendeth to life, the fruit of the wicked to sin, right? So Abel brought the firstling of his flock. He brought the calf. He brought the fat. He brought a savior, right? He brought someone that will be the propitiation for his sin. And he brought the sin to be destroyed and taken away from God, from him. But Cain, on the other hand, Cain brought the fruit of the ground. The verse we just read that mentioned the fruit of the ground, it says in verse 16 of Proverbs chapter 10, again, the labor of the righteous tendeth to life, the fruit of the wicked to sin. So when Abel bring or when Cain brings his own fruit, he labored to bring this before God uh, for what purpose, right? It says the fruit of the wicked is to sin. The labor of the fruit of the wicked, right? Is to sin or is for sinful purposes. Basically, his own works, him thinking that he can achieve uh, being accepted by God by his own doing. Meaning, I can save myself. I can do it. I don't need to bring a sacrifice. I don't need to bring the fat. I can bring the fruit because I just worked and did this in the field. I got some juicy apples. I got some uh, cantaloupe that I'm sure you're going to love because I did it. I'm the one that grew the cantaloupe. I also made some watermelons, and they're extremely huge. No one else can do watermelons this big. So you take my offering and my fruit and accept it. God said, no, no. It's not by our own works. Our righteousness is filthy rags, the Bible says. So it's not by our own works. Right. Not by righteousness, which we have done, but according to Christ's righteousness, we are saved. So, brothers and sisters, this is um, definitely important for us to understand that when we see a lot of these uh, influencers, these TikTokers and YouTubers and Instagrammers, 
Facebookers, when we see them mentioning us getting the victory uh, by our own works, by our own doings, and not mentioning Christ and us giving our sin to Christ and putting away the fat and bringing him as a propitiation to the Father in prayer and mentioning to the Father that there's no other way for me to be accepted by you but by this fat and by this propitiation. If we're not hearing that from these influencers, then we got to question what their doctrine is. We got to question where they got the doctrine originally. Where did you get this from? Because the Bible says that the fat needs to come with the sacrifice. The Bible doesn't say we can bring our own fruit and say, Lord, here's the fruit. I just grew it. You can go ahead and you can t accept this. The Bible doesn't say that. So why is everyone saying all you have to do is say, all right, I believe in Jesus and he's my Lord. And then they continue to keep the fat in their lives, continue to keep the sin. But I did say that Jesus, I accept him and he's my Lord and Savior. Why do we think that that is acceptable before God? Because Cain did the same thing. Cain came before God with an offering. These two individuals were coming to worship God, right? The offering is a symbol of worship. You don't go to a, these uh, religions with false gods, don't go to their God and bring something for no reason. They bring something because they worship their God. They want to show how much they revere the God that they have. So they bring an offering. They bring a gift. So why is it so many people saying you can go to God, just tell them you believe in Jesus, and then your, you will be saved, your sins will be forgiven, and you can just continue on with your life, just do good, and it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Because Cain tried it. He came to worship. He came and did good. He had fruit to give. Imagine somebody that didn't have anything to give, right? So Cain was working, working hard. It's just he thought that his own works would be what is accepted before God. Our works is filthy. We come as descendants from Adam, just like Cain and Abel did, right? So we don't have no hope other than the sin sacrifice and the fat being added, right? The fat being given as well. Jesus alone and Jesus taking away our sins, not us continuing to live in sin. That doesn't make sense. If we continue to live in sin, then we have held on to the fat and just left the sacrifice on the altar. <clears throat> I'm going to keep the fat. I'm going to keep my sin and continue on with my life. But I do worship you. Mm -mm, that doesn't make sense. What kind of God do we serve? We need to think about that. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 13 again. Revelation chapter 13. Actually, let's just go to Daniel 2, because I was going to read, just to reiterate uh, what was mentioned in Revelation chapter 13 pertaining to the mark and the beast. But now we want to see what exactly is a mark and what exactly is the beast, right? We did see what the mark was placed on, right? And we did kind of read in Revelation what the mark was. It's a sign, as the Bible mentioned. And we'll see some more verses as we go on. But let's see what a beast is. Uh, let's go to Daniel chapter 2 first, before we go to chapter 7. Daniel chapter 2, because in Daniel chapter 2, we get a glimpse of the world's history uh, as Daniel was speaking with the king at the time, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, right? And he dreams about this large statue, and the statue had various metals uh, leading down to the feet. Uh, the statue had a head of gold, it had a chest and arms of silver, it had the thighs of brass and the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay mixed together. 
that's going to be another podcast episode for another time. But we're just trying to get through the basics right now because this is not going to be uh, a extensive study uh, at all. But as Daniel is mentioning these different uh, times in history throughout this statue and the body parts, uh, he mentions the last um, the last era uh, being the legs and the feet uh, of clay and iron. He says that this last kingdom, right, in verse 40 of Daniel chapter 2, and the fourth kingdom shall be as or shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things and as iron that breaketh all these speaking of all of the prior metals that was mentioned in the the chapter and the picture of the image that Nebuchadnezzar was dreaming about and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. The last kingdom of this image was going to be an iron kingdom. kingdom. Uh, and throughout the history of the different stages of this statue, you know, the head, the chest, the thighs, the legs, um, it... The kingdoms had something to do with whatever metal they were uh, was used in the statue, right? So, Babylon was a very rich city. Nebuchadnezzar had conquered many of his uh, conquests and enemies, and he had lots of gold to spare. So then Daniel then tells him that he was the head of gold, right? And you go down the list, and there are different things uh, that the metal can be attributed to when it comes to whatever kingdom the body part was representing. But this legs or the fourth kingdom or the legs and the feet with the clay, right? But we're dealing with the legs right now. It mentioned that it will be an iron kingdom. Now in history, you can go back and do your research. Um, you have this kingdom that, was largely known for their use of iron, right? Uh, and the kingdom that I'm mentioning is the Roman kingdom. Rome was largely, uh, Rome had largely used iron uh, in their conquests. And I was on Google today, just kind of looking through and trying to see if I could find something to establish what I'm talking about. And if you go on Google and you type in uh, Rome's use of iron weapons, it'll tell you that iron was used in the Roman armor and weapons, right? But bronze and other metals were still used for some things. Iron replaced bronze as the primary metal used for weapons and armor in Rome after the 3rd century BC when it became more common. So Rome was a kingdom that uh, used iron, is what the is what Google says, right? Google and the Bible can back that up. But what I found uh, interesting is that bef before Rome comes into play, Rome is the fourth kingdom in this statue. Before Rome, it was Grecia. Right. And if you know the story in the Bible, then you'll know what I'm talking about. So before Rome, it was Grecia, but Grecia used brass, as Google had mentioned earlier. It says that uh, iron replaced bronze as the primary metal. So Grecia had used bronze in their conquest. But then once they were conquered and once they were replaced, by Rome, the Iron Kingdom, then the metal was replaced, which I found was very interesting. Uh, and so now let's go to Daniel 7, because we just read about the fourth kingdom and we talked about who it was. We can do a, another extensive study another time just to see who it was. But for this, we're just dealing with the mark of the beast. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23, the Bible says, Thus he said, the fourth beast, which is Rome, shall be the fourth kingdom 
upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. So just another tidbit. The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom. So what is the, a beast? A beast is a kingdom, which is what Daniel said, right? Then after Daniel says, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. So now, anytime you see a horn mentioned in Daniel or somewhere, you can uh, place there in your mind king. So it's like uh, deciphering. You're deciphering what words mean, right? Uh, decrypted messages, so to speak. And so it goes on and says, uh, verse 24, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, right? He shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Now, that fourth kingdom was Rome, right? But then the Bible says that there will be ten horns that come out of the Roman kingdom, or ten kings, essentially, that come out of, out of the beasts, right? Out of this kingdom, it said in verse 24, 10 horns out of this kingdom, 10 kings out of this beast, right? Or out of this kingdom. And it said that after uh, another, uh, after another beast would rise, after that one, it said that he would subdue three kings and he would speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand for until a time and times and the dividing of time. So, this kingdom, or this king, uh, it mentions that he would speak great words against the Most High. You know, one of the greatest... Uh, things that was spoken against the Most High was came from Lucifer himself. Uh, and we can go to the verse. I, didn't, I don't think I added it to my notes, but uh, let me see if I can find it just so we can read it. Um, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14, uh, verse 12, reading down. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12, the Bible says, how, are, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, this is Satan, son of the morning, how art, th how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne, Above the stars of God, I will also, or I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. When you consider those words, those are very great words that you're speaking against the most high God. One, one God who has created existence, right? And this is a created being, an angel, fallen angel, that is, speaking against his God, speaking against his creator, saying, I will be like God. Not in the sense that I'm going to be like him and love everyone and be hum uh, humble and share my things and share my love and comfort everyone. No, not in that sense. Lucifer wanted to be God. So he said, I'm going to ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'm going to exalt my throne and be like the most high. Those are great words that he's speaking. But the Bible says that there will come a king that will be speaking the same way. Right? In some form or fashion, 
he will be speaking just like Lucifer, just like Satan. And he said that I will exalt my own kingdom. Not only that, he will think to change times and laws. Now, it's not uh, secret history. It's not hidden history. You can go on Google and find that the Roman Catholic Church has done a lot of these things. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has even said from its own mouth, and you can pull up documents to see this. The Roman Catholic Church has said that the Pope is infallible, meaning he does not make any errors. Whatever he says is righteous, and whatever he says is just. You can find on Google as well that the Roman Catholic Church says that the Pope is God on earth. Those are great words that are spoken against the Most High. The Roman Catholic Church even has a throne that they allow the Pope to sit on uh, and claim to be God in the seat. So, I think you can kind of see where I'm going with this. This is going to be a short study. It's already an hour, and I haven't even dug deep into my notes. And so I want us to consider uh, and do your own research. Don't take my word for it. Go and type in Google. Go find it. It's up. They didn't take it down. And all of the stuff I'm saying is up, and it's validated. Different magazines and articles that are, are backing what they said and asking them questions. What do you think about this? Oh, the Pope is infallible, and it is the right of everyone to worship. This is what they talk about. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. We're going to see another example of this uh, mark of the beast crisis, right? Now, we want to see uh, in Daniel chapter 3 the account of Nebuchadnezzar and the three Hebrew Israelite boys, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the Bible says in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, right? And this is after Daniel chapter 2 where Nebuchadnezzar had given the dream to Daniel for it to be interpreted so he can understand what the dream meant. Daniel let him know, okay, this is what the dream is. Throughout the history of this statue that you've seen in your dreams, um, these are going to be different kingdoms that succeed each other and your kingdom, which was the head, uh, will not last, right? You will be succeeded by the chest, and then the chest will be succeeded by the legs, and so on, so forth. Uh, and then the next chapter, Nebuchadnezzar then has a bright idea to say, okay, well, if in the dream my kingdom doesn't last and it just degrades in the material, meaning that there's not going to be a better material uh, as far as the resources and financial part of it is concerned than mine, then how about I just alter the dream myself and make a entirely gold statue so then I won't have to worry about someone taking my place. Trying to uh, manipulate uh, God's purposes, basically. And it said uh, in verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits and the height six cubits right and actually the height was three score cubits a score is 20 so that's 60 uh, and then the breadth thereof six cubits right and then the width uh was, if I'm not mistaken, equal to the height and the breadth or the depth of it. So that would be 666. It says, he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together who? The princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers in the provinces to come to the dedication. We see here that Nebuchadnezzar told everybody to come to this 
dedication day, right? This is a day of dedication to the image, to the statue. Now, in Revelation, we read that the beast would cause all, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, right? All nations, languages, kindreds, tongues, and people would come to worship or will be caused to worship, right? The beast in his image and receive the mark. Here, this is a similar situation. Nebuchadnezzar called everyone, essentially, to come and be at this dedication day to worship, right? Let's continue. To come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up, right? So even there, it shows that when Nebuchadnezzar called everyone to come and worship, this is almost like going to church. Nebuchadnezzar called everyone to come and worship, like a church service. This is a dedication day to worship the image, right? Remember the revelation said the image of the beast? What was the beast again? A king, right? Or the, a kingdom, sorry. The horn was the king. But when Nebuchadnezzar comes to have people worship the image, Revelation chapter 3 mentioned the image to the beast, right? The image of the kingdom. So Nebuchadnezzar is having everyone come to worship the image of the kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar himself being a horn or a beast, right? Because he was also a king. But uh, actually, uh, the beast can represent a king or a kingdom, I should say. So now, Nebuchadnezzar says to come worship the beast. Worship the kingdom or the image that I set up. Because Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. Babylon was his kingdom. The statue of him represented him and his whole kingdom. It says in verse 3, Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up, then in herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, right? To you it is commanded or force. It's a command. To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. That's everybody. Don't matter if you're Chinese, you're Indian, Japanese, Mexican, Guatemalan. Doesn't matter what you are, Caucasian, black, doesn't matter. All nations, peoples, and tongues. It says that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace." Does this sound familiar to you? Because this sounds familiar to me. Revelation chapter 3 mentioned that the beast, the kingdom, or the king, will cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, nations, people, kindreds, languages, everyone. He would cause, he would force them to worship, right? He commanded, it says here, it says in verse 5, when it mentions all of the musical instruments, ye fall down and worship. This sounds like a church service. Sounds like a day that was dedicated to worship, right? The dedication or to worship the image of the beast, the kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't fall down and worship, you will be Cast into a fiery furnace. Remember in Revelation chapter 3, it said that he will cause all who should not worship the beast to be killed. Oh, yeah. Let's go on. It says in verse 7. 
Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So it says that everybody fell down and worshipped. Otherwise, you will be killed if you do not worship the image of the beast. And we can assume, just from reading Cain and Abel's story, that those that did worship still had their earthly support, right? You, you won't be killed, and if you agree to do what we're telling you to do, what you're commanded to do, then we don't have to force you. And you can still live your life, and you can, you know, have your resources. But if you don't, you will be cast into a burning, fiery furnace, it says in verse 8, Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews, those are God's people, they spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Right? Key word there was, O king, you have made a decree. You have made a law. You have put into writing. You have said that if no one bow down to worship this golden image, everyone will be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And this was put into law. This was a decree. So remember when Revelation chapter 3 mentioned that the beast would think to change times and laws. He said at a certain time, which was when they heard the music, that the decree is, or the law, if you do not bow down, you should be cast into a burning fiery furnace. But not only do you bow down, you fall down and worship the golden image or the beast, the kingdom. This is the Bible, brothers and sisters. This is what the Bible is telling us. I'm, I'm reading you what the Bible says. I'm giving stories and I'm giving instances. I'm giving accounts of people in the past that went through this mark of the beast type scenario. And what is the Bible given for? It's given for instruction. It's an ensample unto those, uh, unto the ends of the world. Those that the ends of the world are come, this is your guidebook. This is so that you can be prepared for what has already happened. There's nothing new under the sun. Believe it or not. It goes on to say in verse 11, And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews, certain Jews, whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. The word gods there in verse 12 is a lowercase g, meaning it's not the true God that these uh, people were mentioning. In regards to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They weren't mentioning the true God. Otherwise, the G will be capitalized because God is greater than all gods. It was a lowercase God or lowercase G. Which means they were saying they don't serve your gods. The only God other than God himself, the God of heaven, Jesus Christ, the Father, and his spirit is Satan. Lowercase g. There's only two masters, the Bible says. If it's not God, it's Satan. It says in verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, 
O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you guys don't serve my God? You guys don't serve Satan? And you do not bow down to worship the image of the beast? Now, if ye be ready, in verse 15, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music. Now, this was uh, pertaining to music, right? Worship of music with an idol, uh, you know, set up. And if this was done back then, why wouldn't it be done now? You have different churches that play secular music within the church, playing worldly music within God's house. Doesn't make sense. We're not to bring the world inside of God's house. We're supposed to take the world out of us and outside of God's house, brothers and sisters, because our temples, our bodies is also considered the house of God, the Holy Spirit, which temple ye are. It says in verse 15, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Right. They were threatened with death if they didn't worship the image of the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, the image of the beast. It says in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And if you read Revelation chapter 13, about the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, you'll see also that it's mentioned that there are those that are delivered from the mark of the beast as well. And it says, continuing, uh, verse 17, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So did Nebuchadnezzar cause or force people to worship the image of his kingdom or the image of the beast? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. So in this story, we have a mini account, mini account of what we can see happening in our near future. There will be a king, right? And this is a he. Nebuchadnezzar was a male. Nebuchadnezzar caused all, both rich and poor, free and bond, to worship the image of his kingdom, the statue that was set up, which is an image, the idol. But the statue that was set up in Daniel, we've seen in chapter 7 that the kingdom is a beast. The fourth kingdom shall be the beast, or the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom, I should say. And if we didn't worship that image, we were then cast into a burning fiery furnace and killed by force. They had strong men come and bind those three boys and throw them into the fire. So not only did Nebuchadnezzar have people come to worship, right? Had a church service, a dedication day 
a certain day that he set up along with a decree that he made, a law, right? He said that if this is not obeyed and followed, then this will have to be executed as a result unto everyone that doesn't follow. It's the same thing mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. It's the same thing that's going to be happening in our day. The Bible is a book of repetition. It doesn't just give you a story and then you just say, that was a great story. Man, I wonder how they thought about that. No, it's a life occurrence. This is what happened in the past. And God has recorded it for our benefit so that we can be prepared for such a thing. Let's read another verse. Let's go to, actually, let's continue reading. Verse 22. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, one seven times, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now imagine them binding you to throw you into the fire, and the fire is so hot that as they're throwing you in, they disintegrate and they burn up. Amazing. It says in verse 23, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, or, or astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king, we did throw three people in there. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Wow. So because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were tried for their faith, what was within their minds and what they did as a result, or their works, their hand. Right? The hand is a symbol of your works. Your mind is a symbol of your decision, your faith, what you believe. Because their faith and their works was acted upon by Christ's righteousness. In the midst of the fire and the trial, Jesus was there with them, regardless of if they were to be persecuted, tortured, slain, burnt to death or not. Jesus was there with them the whole time, which is great encouragement unto us. It shows us that even though there's a crisis coming, even though the mark of the beast is foretold, if we are like these three Hebrews, these three Jews, then we can achieve the same victory through Christ. And he will be there with us throughout the turmoil and the drama and the situation. Very powerful. It goes on in verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar is, is looking in the fire. He's like, didn't we throw three people in there? How come it's another person and he looks like the son of God? Nebuchadnezzar didn't know who God was. Right? And if he did know, it was because of the example that was given to him of the three boys. And Daniel himself. Right? O king, they don't serve your gods. So it was as a result of these three boys being faithful to God, to Jesus, that the king received a witness of Jesus. And then what happens? Verse 26, then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. What's going on here? Everybody that bowed down to worship the image of the beast, everyone that was caused to worship the beast and his image, everyone that was afraid of the decree and the dedication day, 
everyone that knew that a law was in place so that if no one worships the image to the beast, they will be killed. They seen these three boys that were faithful to their God and that their God has saved them out of the fire. Not only that, the soldiers who were commanded to bind them and throw them in the fire were destroyed. <laughs> 